So welcome Dr. Ahmed. Thank you you are a prominent academic and commentator and you're participating this week in the F World Forum F for Democracy and of course the theme is security, freedom versus security. Um, let's talk about fear. Europe is facing quite some fear now after the latest round of terrorist attacks. What can we say about the way that Europe has reacted to the atrocities in Paris, for example? First of all, as a Muslim and as an observing Muslim, um, I feel heartbroken for France and for Europe. Unfortunately, this is not the first time this has occurred, particularly in Paris. Uh, but I think the fears are rising all, all around and in fact in our panel we'll be discussing fear and hate and I think it plays greatly into the wider narrative. At the moment there is enormous fear for the security of the average citizen in France, literally from a jihadist threat. Um, there are fears about the reactions, what would be the impact on the society to that terrorist effect. There are fears on the 7% of France's population that is uh, Muslim. Um, and the fears on the ramifications for the Muslim migrants uh, fleeing Syria. Um, as, a, as a Muslim who's also a, frequently a journalist, my goal is to try and add nuance to the narrative. And what really alarms me or causes me greatest fear is the lack of nuance and the simplification. Extreme language and extreme speech is being used at this time. The uh, image of the Muslim in the eyes of the onlooker, whoever that may be, has become extremely uh, simplified until it becomes a point or focus of hatred, animosity, fear and suspicion. And I think that's happening in response to this attack probably faster than any other event that I can recall. And is that happening because it's easy or is it happening because there are forces pushing that? Well, that's a good question. I think there's probably many, um, there, there are many mechanisms. As a physician, fear is often an instinctive response to survival. And I think certainly uh, Western Europe, the United States as well went through this the actual essence of our uh, liberal secular democracy is threatened when there is a jihadist attack of the nature that we have just seen in Paris. And so governments, uh, military commanders, policy makers are human beings too and I'm certain are reacting with the fear of God forbid there be another attack like this, how to prevent it, how to stop it, how to preserve life. That I understand. But I think also in the years leading up to this, there's been a decay in the discussion pertaining to the issues. And people are actually afraid of entering that dialogue. That means anyone who is a commentator, anyone who amplifies a message that reaches a large audience, has to take responsibility and identify the perpetrators and the ideology behind this attack. What happened in Paris is an example of Islamist terrorism, or let's call it Islamist jihadism. Islamist, Islamist is a very important word. Islamism is the ideology that has been plaguing us in many parts of the world, uh, from North America to London to uh, the, the Middle East and beyond. And how is that different from Islam? V a very important question you've, you've asked. Islam is a monolithic, excuse me, is a, is a monotheism, Islam is a monotheism with very basic tenets tenant of prayer, charity, fasting, if one is healthy, to go to Mecca and belief in one maker. That is the paramount sum of Islam. Islamism is a man-made 20th century uh, creation uh, birthed in uh, 1928 uh, Egyptian prisons by uh, uh, individuals that were incarcerated who were anti-establishment, very influenced by Marxist teachings. And the pol political totalitarian ideology that is called Islamism has its roots in that. Islamism has some basic, basic uh, premises. Uh, first, Islamism states Islam can be only expressed as a state, Islam as dollar. That means there can be no Islam unless there is a state that sanctions Islam. It's not like having a nation state like the United States where many faiths are welcome or no faith is welcome or the same can be said about France. This is about manifesting Islam in the state, in a condition of a state or let's call it a caliphate. And that's an absolutely unshakable principle of Islamism. In the Quran, a short document, 80,000 words in duration, there is no mention of dollar or state. So Islam as dollar is the first value of Islamism. And when you talk about jihadism, that would be we're, Islamism? We're, or? Yes, we're going to come to that. Yeah, sorry. Um, another important principle of Islamism is the uh, use, or I would call abuse, 
of uh, organs of democracy, so the institutionalization of Islamism. Islam itself in the Quran does not specify how a society should be governed, it does not specify if you should be in a monarchy, if you should be in a democracy, if you should be in, a, in some autocratic condition, uh, it does not specify that. In Islamism, there's great specifics about using democracy and uh, augmenting totalitarian power through democratic organs. So you'll often see Islamist countries have elections which have no meaning, um, have leaders who uh, do not ever relinquish power, and use democracy almost like a one-way train, where we get to an election, we get to hold power, and that's the end of the story. And the most recent example is the Muslim Brotherhood's behavior in Egypt, which exhibited it classically. A very, uh, probably the third tenant in uh, Islamism is a central belief in uh, cosmic, not mortal, but cosmic enmity to anything that is identified as uh, Zionist, Jewish, Jewry. This lethal anti-Semitism um, is something that is, uh, is presented in Islamism as a religious creed and an unshakable belief. So such Jews that as the other. Worse than the other, Jews as some uh, Jews as some as as individuals who do not have the right to an existence. There is a genocidal intent in Islamist anti-Semitism. So good examples of that, you could look at the Charter of Hamas, I believe it's Article 23, which talks explicitly about that. A Muslim like myself, who's a believing and observing Muslim, who can see that as, uh, you know, uh, as absolutely fallacious, and would engage with a, uh, a Jewish uh, colleague and have a Jewish friend and visit uh, Israel and collaborate with Israel, is seen as treasonous, and special punishments are re reserved for her on the basis of Islamism. Um, an additional, uh, and what I think has happened in Paris, one of them you've mentioned, other two tenets of Islamism, evolutionary terrorist jihadism. It takes the jihad that is indeed in the Quran, that is indeed part of Islam, and evolves it into diabolical terrorism the way we've seen it. And that is uh, driven because Islamists have a, uh, a, an intense conflict uh, about purity and authenticity. So the Islamist claims to represent purity, claims to represent authenticity, and its opponent that represents debauchery, uh, that represents um, um, fallacy, is the secular object. Mm -hmm. So what happened in Paris was, a, was an evolutionary terrorist jihadist attack on a secular society, not only because President Hollande uh, was part of a coalition and is part of a coalition combating ISIS, but also because France represents the essence and the beginning of La République of secular liberal democratic values. This France exhibits in such clarity uh, uh, your ability to have any faith, the, the role of state completely external to faith, so faith does not become an arbiter in government, is anathema to Islamism and this is part of its target. So when we look at the tenets and principles of Islamism very, very closely, they diverge so far from Islam that it actually has no um, uh, resonance with the spirit of Islam. This brings us to one of the major fears. It's certainly something I've noticed in my journalism and I've noticed in uh, personal circles as well and I've noticed in circles including Muslims and non-Muslims. There is a tremendous fear to even enter into this discussion. When we see these events that have happened in Paris, Muslims rightly say, these jihadists do not represent my Islam, this jihadism is nothing to do with Islam, Islam is a religion of peace. And many of our American leaders will say the same thing and Prime Minister Cameron will say the same thing. That is true to a point, meaning the jihadists that acted in Paris don't have any uh, re re representation of my Not belief. Not in my name. However, mm. Islamism absolutely emerged from within Islam. There's no question about that, and I say that to you as a believing Muslim. Islamism is, to paraphrase an Iranian uh, expression, the viper that we have nurtured in our bosom. Every Islamist is Muslim. Most Muslims are not Islamists. Now that's a very difficult conversation to have on cable television. Mm. People really don't want to know that. It's much easier to just loathe the entire Muslim community, which is one in five human beings on, on the planet. So that's one discussion that people are afraid to have. And I think there is denial on both ways. 
I see that when the attacks happened in Paris, there were statements from the King of Jordan, there were statements from the King of Saudi Arabia, there were statements from the President of Egypt, they communicated directly with the leader of France, um, appro perfectly appropriate. But there is not, um, apart from the President of Egypt, uh, President Sisi, no Muslim leader to my knowledge has taken on the fact that Islamism is rooted and has its foundation in an abuse and perversion of Islam. It is not coming from the ether. If there was no Islam, there could be no Islamism. What do I mean by that? Islamism takes metaphors, language, images, extracts of the Quran from my faith and turns it into explicit political totalitarianism. Why is it totalitarianism? It seeks to de-self the individual, like all totalitarianisms. It seeks to take away yours and my religious freedom, yours and my right to expression, let's say freedom of expression through implementing blasphemy laws, the rights to all the privileges of liberal democracy. This is totalitarianism, but we must admit that it has emerged from Muslims and is merged from inside Islam, but it is a new movement. It is not a religion. The reason Islamists want it to be seen as a religion, some are deluded enough to believe it's a religion, I could allow that. But if we see it as a religion in the modern world, it is privileged with all kinds of protections as uh, all of us in liberal democracies would not defame another's religion. There are special protections afforded to that. That kind of hesitancy really benefits the Islamists. Thank you so much for clarifying the, the, the inconsistencies and the, the lack of comprehension in basic terminology. And I'd like to turn now a little bit to the way that the non-Muslim world looks at the Muslim world and looks at phenomena which, as you rightly say, are rooted in origins um, that have a relationship to the Muslim world. Let's talk about the way the world media have covered the terrorist attacks in Paris. Yes. Is it actually feasible? Is it morally acceptable? that we have such an, an explosion of coverage about one event in one country outside the Muslim world when at the same time you have millions, well millions is perhaps an exaggeration, but many Muslims themselves victims of Islamism um, being killed on almost a daily basis, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Afghanistan. So Jeremy, that's a terrific question. <laughs> two, two things come to mind. First of all, uh, almost simultaneous to the Paris, att Paris attacks, perhaps separated by a day or two, were the events in Beirut where ISIS suicide bombers targeted, in fact, a Hezbollah stronghold. And many people, uh, I think 40 or so, lost their lives and many were injured. And there has been a movement on social media, the Beirutis feel forgotten. Uh, to put the numbers in scale, I can speak about Pakistan. And since uh, September 11th, if we look at the number of casualties uh, of civilians that have uh, lost their uh, lives to Islamist terrorism, uh, actually the, the numbers are shared across the Afpak border, we're talking about the loss of 149,000 lives. Mm. Now bear in mind, civilian deaths are not as well documented there as they are here. Now we are devastated for the uh, many pa people that lost their lives here in Paris, but you're right, the scale is much greater in the Muslim world. And then we put into context the issue with Syria, where over 11 million people have been displaced from their home, many millions of them children, um, tens of thousands of them afoot looking for a, a place of refuge. Uh, so the and, and the scale of the media is fascinating because yesterday I was in the Place de la Republique doing an interview for an American network and I could not, it, I could not conceive of the media circus. It's certainly something I've never seen in terms of the global media descending on there. Um, I think some of it is the media actually has an intrinsic fascination with this uh, issue. It's almost like the media, like ordinary human beings, has become mesmerized with the horror and we know that media amplification of events has a huge effect. That is actually why September 11th reverberated to such a great d degree. We lost over 2,900 uh, uh, people in that day in New York City, but it was also one of the first media events that individuals recorded with early digital cameras. So the reverberation of Im images was colossal. Um, I think the media covers stories that it feels relevant and there is a degree, it, it is not a criticism, it's an observation, 
and I can count myself as somebody who is European and, and also about to become American, but there is something called narcissistic compassion, which has been uh, written about by scholars. Um, and I first came across this term in terms of narcissistic compassion after reading some essays uh, to do with September 11th. Uh, when we see people who look like us, uh, devastated, uh, targeted, murdered, maimed, uh, we feel this in our soul. We can identify with them. Yes. Uh, when we see, uh, which we actually don't even see the images of, uh, let's say, 142 children murdered in Peshawar, men, most of the children, children of military officers who've been fighting uh, the Taliban in Pakistan, officers that I've actually traveled with to that region and met with Taliban operatives, uh, we don't feel that resonance. So. I think the reflection of the media descending on Paris is a reflection of our own narcissistic compassion, of which I am also guilty, even though I can identify with other groups. And that probably is why, and that dissonance covering Paris, not covering Beirut, is another resentment that could be destructive. One of the other, one of the things that the media have been pretty good in covering is, of course, the arrival of refugees from Syria in, yes. in Europe, in the European yes. Union, particularly. Um, our Secretary General said yesterday that he was uh, afraid that uh, migrants to Europe would be blamed for the terrorist attacks. Mm. Um, is that a phenomenon that we're seeing? Is that a use? Are politicians, are media, and uh, public uh, commentators actually making that link between? Well, refugees and terrorists? I can only speak for what I've seen in the United States. I just arrived to France uh, 24 hours ago. So in the United States, actually, there has been, even though that was a nation birthed on migration, migrants who were fleeing what they perceived to be religious persecution, um, that is how America came into being. Um, there has been an incredible animus about immigration for many years, beginning with the entry of individuals from uh, Mexico and Central America into the United States without documents. So that has been part of the discussion for a long time. As the Syrians began to migrate, this rhetoric really escalated and is now a major part of the presidential campaigning in the United States. Mm -hmm. What astonished me is as I landed uh, in Paris yesterday, I began reading the headlines of yesterday. It was 26 American governors. That's over half of the governors of the states in the United States have announced that their states will not accept refugees from Syria. Bear in mind, I mentioned 11 million people are displaced from Syria. Turkey, as far as I know, is host, hosting over 2 million refugees and has been doing for many years. About 1.6 million, I believe, are in Lebanon. There are other refugees in Jordan. It's the United States was considering taking 10,000 refugees. We are a country of 310 million. This is a microscopic number. And now we have half of the leadership of the United States, very go a governor is very powerful, saying, not in my state, I'm not gonna take the risk. And to me, that is a, rev that is a complication of ISIS's assault on Paris that even ISIS could not have hoped for. Just as we had no idea that September 11th would trigger the events it did, and we often said this was, in the eyes of bin Laden, a success beyond imagination, the Paris attacks, for some reason, have triggered this astonishing fear to do with a Syrian refugee. So what does that mean? We go back to the lack of nuance. The Syrian refugee now embodies everything that is feared about perpetrators that did Charlie Hebdo or did the Paris attacks, the Syrian refugee has become ISIS. The Syrian refugee is fleeing its country because of what I regard close to a genocidal war Bashar Assad has waged upon his own people and a small percentage of deaths at the hands of ISIS. We must put it into proportion, sometimes something that the US administration is not doing. They're sidestepping this issue. So those individuals who've been persecuted in ways, as we've just seen in P Paris, yes, two days ago, several days ago, are now deemed to be the perpetrator. 
it does bring to mind an, uh, uh, something that's been troubling me, and it may be not an appropriate comparison, but it does bring to mind uh, the, another group of people in Europe who were turned away, another group of people who, like the Syrian refugees, may have met barbed wire, may have met uh, rough seas, may have met closed borders, or may have met a world that simply turned away, and it reminds me of the story of Jewish refugees who were attempting to escape the Shoah. Now, I'm part of the Shoah Foundation. I'm in some uh, 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 positions on committees and councils with them, and therefore I fully understand the dimensions and the unique aspect of the Shoah. There has been no event in human memory to equal it, but the kind of neglect and the denial and the, the lack of compassion that we're showing Syrian refugees in this hour, I think undermines our own humanity. And I think there you're touching on the values which are very much the founding values of the Council of Europe. Uh, so oh. I, I'm interested to know now if I can move on a little bit to talk about the response following the terrorist attacks and the fact that this is now being portrayed as, a, as an attempt to defend the values of Europe, to defend the values of, of, of civilization against non-civilization, mm. I think it's been framed too. Really? What do you think about that? So I haven't uh, heard about this perhaps uh, at this stage. Uh, are you uh, meaning that the Syrian refugees could bring with them? No, I'm talking uh, more about the terrorist attacks in Paris I and see. the fact that the French uh, military have uh, launched essentially a, a war. President yes. Hollande has announced a war yes. against, uh, against... I notice that you say Is ISIL and not Daesh. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, and Daesh uh, means ISIS. I mean, I think the okay. abbreviation in Arabic means ISIS. And also this now obsession with saying Daesh, Daesh is another example of our fear. Right. And I know the argument, President Obama uses the argument a lot, we don't want to use the word ISIS, we don't want to call it an Islamic State, uh, but I think that's neither here nor there. They, they call themselves Islamic State, we'll label that, and we have enough wherewithal that we can differentiate it, its, mm -hmm. its values. Um, I think we're pitted against two conflicts, perhaps to answer your question. The major conflict is actually a war uh, an earth-shaking war within Islam. And that's something that nobody wants to get involved with. Non-Muslim Western governments do not want to even opine on that in terms of the battle for the, the soul, shall we say, of Islam, uh, which is being waged between Islam and Islamism. If we want to clarify it a little bit further, this manifestation that we're seeing now, whether it's ISIS, before ISIS, whether it's Al-Qaeda, before Al-Qaeda, we have established movements like Hezbollah and Hamas, who all operate on Islamist values. Incidentally, one of the very frightening things that's coming out is Hezbollah condemned the ISIS attacks on France and is therefore attempting to buy itself legitimacy. Hezbollah has exactly the same uh, policies and procedures and uh, uh, and codas that meet Islamist totalitarian ideology. So that's a frightening complica complication. There's a terrible fear to get into the fact that this is a war within Islam. This war is not only originating from the 1920s Islamist ideology, it's a tension that's existed since at least the ninth century in Islam, several centuries after Islam was revealed, between civil, pluralist, or Islam Islamic rationalist philosophers and those that wanted to impose orthodoxy. Uh, it's worth noting that Sharia law, which Islamists seek to impose in their defined state, that they think that's the only way Islam can be manifested, Sharia law was not codified for several centuries after the Prophet's death. So much of what passes as Sharia law, whichever version you want to see, is not representative of the spirit of Islam. And we can have a big discussion about that. So the big conflict is the, the war within Islam. Mm -hmm. And those that are outside of Islam, for them, it feels that there is also, and I think they're correct about this, an assault on liberal democratic values. So when the president of France says France is at war, he's actually correct. And I think that uh, this will require not only a military defense and a physical defense, but also political defense. And what I see so lacking in, in the United States is Americans themselves, not all Americans, there are of course some highly educated um, Americans, but often people don't understand the values of liberal democracy, even as they are citizens birthed in a liberal democracy. The best way I understand, and I'm I may have been guilty of the same, I was born in Britain into a liberal democracy and enjoyed all the privileges. I never understood the value of democracy until I lived in Saudi Arabia without a democracy. 
And I feel unless you're in a society where there was no basis for democracy, you truly can't understand its values. So we have a war inside Islam and we have a conflict. I wouldn't call it a clash of civilizations, which is how Samuel Huntington put it many years ago, because I don't see Islamism as a civilization. Did we see Nazism as a civilization? Do we see communism as a civilization? No, we see them as political ideologies that we can discuss in political science. They may have attempted to make civilizations and failed dismally, but I don't see this as a civilization. And I think once we extract, if we use nuance, we can do some very good things. We can take religion out of the argument, even though this is emerging from within a population of a massive faith. But when we take religion out of it, it's not so frightening to talk about Nazism. It's not so frightening to talk about communism. Everybody that is in a liberal democracy would understand what that is and impugn no one for talking about it. And Islamism should be treated with exactly the same nonchalance and exactly the same cool eye. The other thing that we are battling, and I think it does come because we're, unlike the period of Nazism or even communism, we're now living in a world which is heavily mediated Nothing happens without it being mediated somehow, whether we're just making a Twitter yep. or we're making a Vine or we're, we're on camera. And so that amplifies knowledge, but also ignorance and bias. And that also requires um, a, tre a tremendous commitment to trying to have the very difficult conversations, which can be frightening, they can be high risk, and they can be incendiary. So far, even at the apex of global leadership, there has not been a willingness to have this uh, discussion. And that's benefiting only the Islamists. The Islamists benefit tremendously from being merged with me. Oh, we're like her. That benefits them because I'm protected, I'm uh, able to worship the way I want, eat the correct food that is what I need. This is, I'm privileged. They seek the privileges, even as they are just as totalitarian as someone who would be uh, subscribing to Nazi ideology, but not only subscribing to Nazi ideology, Mein Kampf is printed in the United States, maybe it's also printed in France, I don't know. So it's not about not engaging, and it's not about not having ideas, but it's engaging with them on the same footing as you would a political ideology and not a privileged faith. Dr. Quanta Ahmed, thank you so much for this incredibly lucid analysis and for sharing your thoughts and your very coherent vision with us today. Thank you, Jeremy.